What I teach is something very special, mm -hmm. which is called the phenomenology or a phenomenology of the image. And that, the origin of that is music. Mm -hmm. Because I studied with uh, one of the greatest conductors of the 20th century, Sergio Celibidake. Okay. I studied with him for three years, phenomenology of music. And many things that I did intuitively before in photography, I became much more conscious. And then he inspired me to create a phenomenology of the image. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry for the lack of modesty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only person in the world who teaches that uh -huh. because I have created it. Yes. Well, that's something to be proud of, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, but I haven't finished the, the book yet. Okay. I'm, I'm working on it. Okay. And then the main thing is uh, for people to be conscious of certain things and then forget about them. But without this consciousness, you won't get too far. Okay. So the first what I teach is that there, the first thing I teach is that there are no rules. There are only principles. Mm -hmm. And the principles are very broad. And you can apply them in your own way. In your, in your own individual, personal way, but there are no rules. Okay. Now, the first thing is that an image is made up of elements and the relationship between these elements. Everything in life is relations. Everything. Physics, mathematics, astronomy, biology, engineering, personal relations, working relations, everything is relations. Yeah. Now, if you don't see that in an image, if you don't see how the elements are related, and if you don't become sensitive to it, because you have to, it's a process of evolution. Yeah. It takes me several years to become sensitive to the different types of relationships between the elements of an image. Mm -hmm. But if you are not conscious of that, you won't get too far. That's an interesting way to look at it. I, I, I agree with you. Everything you say makes sense to me because um, I always feel like uh, also in our school that they teach us techniques and um, they push us like in, this, in a certain box and tell us that we should stay there to, um, to get good grades. And, and that becomes a cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it takes the, the creativeness and the fun out of... Out of because first, first of all, there are no authorities. Okay. There, that, you know, a 100% authority doesn't exist in this world. Mm -hmm. Never. People who, are, who really know what they are doing may be an authority of 70%. But 30% they make mistakes. And thanks to that, the world goes forward. Mm -hmm. Because of the mistakes? Because of the mistakes they make or the things that they haven't uh, realized. Okay. And that's where we can come in. Mm -hmm. If we have a teacher or a lecturer, I never consider that person as an authority. With all my respect to Celibidake, there are certain things that I disagree with him. Mm -hmm. I also am, have been very influenced by a, call it a philosopher or a teacher Jiddu Krishnamurti, I don't know if you have heard of no. him. Well, is it, but also I don't agree 100% with mm -hmm. what he says. I always try to find out uh, if there is room for a different interpretation or there is a room for a different search. Yeah. So, to me there are no authorities. Interesting. No, <laughs> absolutely no. I, I don't like to learn from other people. I usually learn by myself. Yeah, and from but, our own mistakes, right? Uh, no, uh, it's not, not only learning from mistakes, but learning from your own experience. Because the only thing that counts is your experience. If you see that so much, something doesn't work, okay, it's a mistake, it's a false okay. hypothesis, mm -hmm. then you have to find out something else. Yeah. But then we go back to uh, three things that make, a, make an image. Form, content, and content is, well, the third one is related to content, which is relationships. Mm -hmm. Now you will ask about form. Form is composition. Yeah. Now, why do we compose? Why do we uh, search a certain composition in an image? Why do you, what do you think? Because it's appealing to the eye, because it makes you feel something. But why? 
but why? Some things just work. I don't know. I um, when I take pictures, I just go with a feeling, like you said, and I'm I'm probably not conscious enough as of why I make those decisions. I just I look and I see something and I think this works. Composition is putting things in order. Why do we search order? Because around us is chaos. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're looking at chaos in every day, in almost every aspect of our life. Now, if you put in an image chaos, who's going to look at that? If you see it every day. Probably no one. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be attracted by order, because yeah. this is what we search inside. Yeah. We always search order, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't achieve it, but at least we, we search it. Right. So that composition is order. Mm -hmm. And we want to put things in order so that they will be attractive to other people. Now, how do we compose? Well, what you, as, as you said, by feeling, not by rules. Yeah. Now, why cannot there be rules? Because if I approach a subject that I want to photograph and I think of rules, then I create a distance to that subject. Mm -hmm. I'm imposing an intellectual structure which has nothing to do with the subject, but it's all in my imagination. Yeah. So I really, I don't see anymore. I, I see what I think I see, but not what I see. Mm -hmm. The mind can be deceiving. <laughs> but it is deceiving yeah. most of the time. And I have to get rid of that. Yeah. So composition is putting things in order, but uh, not intellectually, mm. but mainly emotionally. emotionally yeah. Now what about content? What, is, what, what, do we, what should we search in the content of images or anything that we do in our lives? Um, I always look for the beauty <laughs> and beauty can be many things it can also be um, uh, you know spon spontaneousness and mm -hmm. uh, something out of the ordinary that you might see in your daily uh, surroundings you see something that's not supposed to be there but it's beautiful and you take a picture okay now is there something behind beauty if you go deeper um, what moves you even more than beauty? Love. <laughs> yes, but love is something also which is part of something which, which is more general. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it all comes down to emotions. And is, something, is there something beyond emotions? I'm thinking really hard. <laughs> Can you see my thinking face? Yes. <laughs> um, something beyond emotions. Well, there are two questions I asked you. Mm -hmm. What is beyond beauty? And what is beyond emotions? Uh, fear? That's an emotion. <laughs> Give me a hint. <laughs> uh, truth. That's the answer. That's the answer. Okay. You are looking for truth. Mm -hmm. Now, what kinds of truth are there? Um, all kinds? <laughs> yes, but then it becomes meaningless. There is a physical truth, right? If I do that, then I'm showing you five fingers. Mm -hmm. That's the truth, but yeah. it uh, doesn't, make, doesn't mean too much. Most people repeat opinions. When, when I speak with someone, after a while I get really, or maybe even one or two minutes, if I begin to see that he is giving me opinions, mm -hmm. I'm not interested. Because I know that, that that has nothing to do with truth. Mm -hmm. Most people will tell you about things that they have heard, mm -hmm. they have uh, read, or will repeat some so-called historical facts. Mm -hmm or repeat what they have uh, read in the newspapers or on television. Yeah. And that's not the truth. Because usually we don't have enough access to the sources. Mm -hmm. So it's either a partial truth or it's completely false. Because sometimes, you know, you have archives which are kept secret for 50 years. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they are published. Oh, 
So that's the way it used it was, and I didn't know about it. And for you know, who killed Kennedy? No one knows. Yeah. But you have one hundred theories about yeah. it. True. Yeah. <laughs> but no one knows. So that kind of truth is difficult to access to, to have an access to it because you don't have access to the sources. So it's not a, it's not the kind of truth that interests us. Mm -hmm. The same thing is with with you take photographs. Well, everything yeah. everything that you photograph is if, unless you manipulate in Photoshop and so on is the truth because that's the way that's what you saw. Yeah. But as you know, it's not an interesting truth. It's simply a description and illustration of what you have seen. Nothing more than that. Yeah. So, so who is interested? Well, from from a historical point of view, if you would like to see how Amsterdam, how Rotterdam looked before it was bombed, well, that's that's very that's very valuable, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that one that's one of the roles of photography. But there is there are two truths that are very very important. One is scientific truth, which uh, you can find in some areas in some restricted domains, in physics or astronomy or ma mathematics, everything is true, that's, uh, that's something else. But these are limited truths, and th th those you can find. In biology, there is no truth, mm -hmm. because it's mainly statistical. No two people are alike. No. If you find a remedy for something, when it may work 70% of the cases, so it's not true. Yeah. <laughs> it's statistical. Yes. So that you have to take in, into account. But there is one thing that is true, and this is what you said without knowing it. Okay, really? <laughs> and that's love. <laughs> yeah. But it's not love for one person. Mm -mm. It's a universal love. Yeah. And that love is an in, in, inner truth. It's a spiritual truth. Yeah. It's something that you feel when you are absolutely free, completely free, no fears, no positive or negative emotions, nothing. At that moment, you are nobody. And it's perfect being nobody. Do you realize that? Yes. <laughs> it seems like a really nice feeling. <laughs> it's, well, it's not a feeling. It's a, it's, a, it's a very deep experience, being nobody. You don't care about the opinions of others. You don't care about uh, your ambitions. You don't want to do, achieve anything. You, are, you have no fear. You, have, you are completely a free person. And this is the true definition of art. Mm -hmm. it's, Art is so, a, a human creation that makes you free as a person for a certain period of time, maybe a small period of time, right? You cannot be free all the time because you, could not, you would not be able to function in reality, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. <Yeah. laughs> but that is re the real art. When you, are, when, when you do something, you create something that in other people uh, that gives other people a sense of absolute freedom. Now, is there something that an artist can brag about? No, because what he is giving to others is not his. Mm -hmm. It is something that you open up, you receive a certain kind of unknown energy. You know, some people, materialistic people, will say, well, it's all chemical reactions but it's yeah. there. Other people will be say, well, it's a cosmic energy that came inside. No one knows, right? But you, you have it. You create in such a state. And then you can give it to others who are prepared to receive it. Mm -hmm. receive it. So what is the, a good definition of an artist? He's a spiritual courier. Nothing more. Okay. Nothing more than that. So, Am I going to be, first of all, I never call myself an artist. Mm -hmm. I never do that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's only a temporary state yeah. that happens from time to time. Yeah. But it's not a permanent state. And another thing is that uh, it's not something that I'm giving from myself. I'm only an intermediary. Mm. Okay, and that is what is not taught in schools. Because the people who teach it have never experienced it. So how, how can they yeah. teach something that they have never experienced? So do you think that's because um, they are not open to it? Or are they just too focused on, uh, you know, making it in the world, like money and other things? Well, there's, there's something which, which is written in the Bible, which mm -hmm. is very interesting, <laughs> which, is, which, are, which, which is, we are all made in the image of God. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Well, okay, that's has several interpretations, but to me the, the best interpretation is that every one of us has a spiritual potential. And that spiritual potential is what uh, makes us in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Now, for some people it's not God, it's energy, it's light and so on. It doesn't matter how you call it, the name is not important. Mm -hmm. But the importance is the experience or the feeling itself, which goes beyond emotions. And everyone has a potential to do it, and that we are equal. Yeah. We are not equal in talent, intelligence and so on, that's, uh, that's not true. But in this, in, the, in our spiritual potential, everyone is equal. But most people don't develop it. One is because they are not even aware that they have such a potential. And the second thing, it requires a lot of work on oneself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the consciousness, for instance, a, a, con a consciousness which is very difficult to, to have. The consciousness is mainly the following, that there's a duality in us. We are all dual or plural people, mm -hmm. which we have several personalities. And in our daily life, we have to use our intellect. Because without it, we are completely lost. We, couldn't, we wouldn't be able to work, function, do anything. But then the, the, the mistake that we make is that when we don't need our intellect for practical applications or for professional applications, we have a lot of psychological thoughts, mm -hmm. which are completely unnecessary. And those psychological thoughts are the barrier to a spiritual world. So that's why, why most religions, well, all religions fail, except for, for very few people who practice them. Because what good does it do it if you go to a church or a synagogue or a mosque? If uh, you pray, right? once a week or even every day and then all of these psychological thoughts come to you and destroy what you have achieved. Mm -hmm. Nothing nothing comes out of that. In other words, it takes a lot of awareness yeah. to be able to, to say, okay, now there's a psychological thought coming. It's like a cloud. I'm not going to hang to it, but you simply let it go. And How many people do that in the world? I think very few. <laughs> but I think maybe it's because it's really confronting also to, to get to know yourself on that kind of level. Maybe well, that's why people close their eyes, because it's easier. Well, first of all, our lives are full of tensions. And these tensions, for instance, if you, are, if you want to create something and you are under tension, Whatever you create is going to be simply a visual or sound effects, which will create from time to time some emotions on other people, mm -hmm. but nothing more than that. Yeah. To be able to create something deeper, you have to be completely without any tensions or with a minimum of tensions. If you take Rembrandt or Van Gogh or Beethoven and so on, mm -hmm. you cannot say that they were mystics. <laughs> they were very far from being mystics. Mm -hmm. But they had a quality which uh, other people don't have. One is to open up for that energy to come to them and then get rid of the tensions that create, that everyday life creates. And this is what distinguishes a great artist. That plus the talent to express himself yeah. or herself. Yes. It's, it's the combination of these two things. It's not being a mystic, but simply for a moment absolutely to be so concentrated in your, in your work and so open that you are full of energy and you create while you are with that energy that you have. Now, since most people are not capable of doing that, then they create an intellectual art, mm -hmm. conceptual art, and this is what they teach, this is what they appreciate, and then they form like a mafia, <laughs> conceptual mafia in the world, which is uh, museum curators, gallery owners, publishers and so on, and so, teachers and so on and so forth, without realizing that what they have done is very superficial, or what they are doing. And this is one of the main problems. Now, what, what I teach is something different from other teachers, because I cannot tell a person, okay, now do choose this direction. Mm -hmm. 
Because if he chooses that direction, which is more spiritual, he won't make a career. Yeah. And there are people who want to make a career, yes. want to be famous and so on. Okay, fine. There are other teachers who will teach you how to do it, yeah. but not me. Mm. <laughs> That's the main difference. That's a choice that you That's make. That's a choice, yeah. but I, I don't tell students, well, do it the way I, I am telling you, because I'm not a dogmatic person. Mm -hmm. Now, you see what happens in, in art, or with the work of art, is that it's, there's a triangle. One is the author or the creator. The second one is the work itself, which could be material or immaterial, like in music. And the third one is the spectator, which is either an auditor or someone who is a viewer. Now it takes those three things to create a work of, a work of art. In other words, do you realize that you, as a viewer, are part of the work of art? Yeah. Without yes. you, there's no art. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like a sound, right? Yeah. right? The sound is waves in the air, right? Now, if there is no person, animal, or who has a hearing mechanism, right, or hearing mm -hmm. system, there is no sound. No, someone has to hear it. <laughs> That's right. And this is the same thing with the work of art. Yeah. If there is no one who has the sensitivity to appreciate it and the openness, there is no work of art. Mm. If I go to a museum, for instance, I went to the National Gallery in Dublin, mm -hmm. and there is a, there's a Vermeer there, one Vermeer. There are two Rembrandts, one Vermeer, mm -hmm. and also some other, some other paintings. But I spent, I think, two months in Dublin. Okay, so first time I go to the gallery, right after my trip from Warsaw to Dublin, and I look at those paintings and I say, okay, fine, very, very nice, nothing more. Then I go one month later, oh, I'm beginning to feel something. Mm -hmm. Then I go just before I return to Warsaw, when I'm completely out of tension, and then what I have to do is sit down, do some breathing exercises for 15 or 20 minutes to relax completely and make sure also that there is no, no one around. So when I look at the painting, uh, I'm by myself. Yeah. I tell my students, as a joke of course, well, eat a lot of garlic. <laughs> <laughs> so they stay away. <laughs> <laughs> so they stay away. And at that moment, after two months of relaxing, I begin to feel the energy coming out from some of the paintings. Mm -hmm. And then I participate in the work of art. So you, you have to take the time to... Yes, yeah. but it's a whole preparation. Yeah. It's, a, it's a whole preparation from my point of view. If I go to a concert, then I don't listen to music for about two days. Mm -hmm. Before the concert, several hours, I don't speak with anybody. And then when I go to a concert and the two ladies begin to speak before the concert, <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a good thing that I don't know the... <laughs> An aggressive person. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking of my own uh, um, experiences, but I have visited concerts before and then I'm, I'm halfway through and I'm like, I just want to go home, this is too much and I can't appreciate it, so maybe it's a good idea to, to take... Yes, but it's not only that. The problem is, is with the interpretation. Mm -hmm. Because, again, it's the same problem. One is... Conductors, musicians, and so on are not sensitive enough to the relations between the sounds. That's one thing. And another thing is that uh, they are not conscious of certain structures that is uh, in, the, in the music itself that you have to respect. Mm -hmm. Because no one teaches them in the, in the conservatories. It's the same problem that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. There comes a teacher, they, they learn, for instance, to play the violin or the trumpet or the piano technically without fault. Yeah. Fantastic, right? Technically, the younger generation is getting better and better. Yeah. The problem is with imposing an interpretation. The teacher tells him, this is the way you should play. Mm -hmm. And then the poor student does the same thing. Yeah. But it doesn't come from the inside. And then that's why you get bored. I also get bored. Yeah. And then in the middle of the concert, I leave. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I paid, I don't know, fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a waste. It was a waste of money. Yeah.
but yeah. it's their fault because they are not conscious of what music is about. Okay, so it's not my fault. No, it's not your <laughs> fault. If you are relaxed and if you are concentrated in the music, because the, the main problem that people do, the main problem is with people when they are listening to music, is that they are thinking of something else. Yeah. And if you do that, then it's your fault. I but it's say. also but it's also the fault of the interpreter. Mm -hmm. Because if the interpretation is right, then you get so absorbed that you don't think of other things. Mm -hmm. So it, it requires a double training. Yeah. You, as an auditor, who has to get rid of other thoughts, and the interpreter who has to get to the right interpretation. Now, if both fail, <laughs> you are wasting $50. Yes. <laughs> Waste of money. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. So this is what I uh, learned from Celi Bidake, mm -hmm. was, for instance, how, how, the, how music is structured, what are the things that you have to look for, and then I translated it into an image, mm -hmm. into images. What is it that you have to look for in images? One example is that everything counts. Mm -hmm. Everything in an image counts. There's no such a thing that you have a few things which are important and the rest is not. That's not true. Everything counts. Another thing which is very important, it turns out that we don't know how to look. Because it turns out that we have something in our retina, which is called the macula. Mm -hmm. And it's five millimeters by five millimeters. It's the only place where we see sharp. Mm -hmm. The rest is simply to look at the movement around us, yeah. especially when you are driving a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not only seeing sharp, but you have to yeah. also see if there is any movement around you, right? So it's so small that when you're looking at an image, you cannot see the whole, unless it's a stamp. <laughs> or unless you go very far away, but then you don't see the details. Which means that when you get close to an image, you have to travel. You choose a well. You, there is a point that attracts you at the beginning. It's different for everyone, but usually, if there are photo, if it's a photograph or a painting of people, it's usually the faces yeah. that attract you right away. Yeah. But then you have to trace the image. You see, trace the whole thing, and this tracing is something that most people don't do. Mm -hmm. Or if they do it, they only do it very partially and then they go away. Yeah. This is why, what I call uh, image tourism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're a, a visual tourist, mm -hmm. right? You're a visual tourist, but you're not really watching. Okay, now if you look carefully and you trace every single element of the image, then there happens something which is similar to music. If there's something that doesn't belong to the image, you are out. Mm -hmm. if, if you are out too many times, then you don't feel the image. Mm -hmm. Because you are looking, we are all, always looking for unity. You know, we are divided people. We, are, have dual, we have schizophrenia, if you want, dualism, anything you want. Because the intellect and our spiritual part are completely separate. Yeah. One doesn't go along with the other one and we need both. Yeah. So there's a dualism. The only, the only thing that is unified in us is our spirit. The only thing that is unified in us is our spirit. So when you are looking at an image or listening to a concert, the only, if it's a unity, then we feel it spiritual. If there are no barriers in us, then you are looking for that such a unity, and the unity will only find by tracing. Mm -hmm. And then every, every element has to fit there. Sometimes there may be some element that doesn't fit, then you go out. Sometimes, as Celi Didake said, well, out of 100 concerts that I give, only about three are perfect. Someone makes a mistake. This instrument comes too early or too late, mm -hmm. or someone is not in tune. But if it's individual, if it's a few, places where you are out, then it's not a disaster. 
The same thing with an image. If, if you are out in a few places, mm -hmm. it's not a disaster. But if you are out too often, then it is a disaster. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Then other people start to notice as well, right? That's right. Yeah. But they don't know why. That's, that's the main thing. You, you see something is wrong, but you don't know why or what. That's actually. right. Interesting. And how does that translate to um, uh, giving an education? Because how do you um, say an image is right or wrong or you pass this, this assignment? No, I, I, I never say that an image is right or wrong. I give a very concrete example. Someone shows me an image, or I show someone mm -hmm. an image, and I tell them uh, which elements fit, which elements do not fit, mm -hmm. uh, which elements are disproportional, there is too much, which elements do not belong. But if everything fits in place, sometimes the image doesn't give you a, something emotional or spiritual. So there is no rule. There's not, everything is so irrational mm -hmm. that you cannot tell in advance. But what I teach is the following. What to be conscious about. Okay. You have to be conscious of certain things. Yeah. Okay, at the beginning you are very conscious. Then that consciousness, slowly with time, goes to part of your intuition, goes to you as an intuition. And you don't, you're not even conscious of that anymore, but you see it right away. In other words, you stop being conscious and you feel it. Yeah. If I look at the subject, I can tell right away if it's going to work or not. Okay. Okay, now, um, what, I can, what I can teach is to prepare the ground for something meaningful to, to be created. In other words, I never know if you respect everything Mm -hmm. If something meaningful will be created, there's no such a thing. But if you don't respect certain principles and you create something meaningful, it's like winning the lottery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the difference. So I cannot teach you how to create something meaningful, but how to prepare the ground mm -hmm. to create something meaningful. This is what I can teach. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> For instance, uh, if you take a picture of, uh, if you take a painting of Rembrandt, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a rich background, the background may be mainly, let's say, very dark, but with colors, with shades and so on. Then you begin to see the relations between the background and the person, the portrait. Yeah. Now, if you take it into Photoshop, mm -hmm and you make the whole background black, you change completely the character of the picture. Mm -hmm. Then the person becomes very important, but there's a relation that is missing, mm -hmm. for instance. So these things I can, I can show. Yeah. Or for instance, another thing, there was a painter and a musician at the same time, that was Paul Klee, you probably heard of him, a Swiss painter. Yeah. Okay. Now, since he was a professional violinist mm -hmm. and one of the great paint, greatest painters of the 20th century, then he was always he was capable of comparing music and, uh, and uh, painting. Then he said, okay, when you are listening to music, everything is given to you. There's nothing you can change. The sequence of sounds, how long they last, rhythm and so on. You are simply an auditor, but there's nothing you can change. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're looking at an image, the situation is different because everything depends on your trace or your tracing of the image. Now, it can happen when you have really a very good work of art that when you, tra when you choose a different trace, your emotions change. And that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I show paintings of Vermeer mm -hmm. where, where you can do that or a painting of Munch where you, if you go in one direction, it becomes depressing. Yeah. <laughs> if you go in a different direction, it's very optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> that's and that's the beauty of an image compared to music, yeah. that you can change emotions according to your tracing. Yeah. There's a lot of information that I have to process <laughs> now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Fine, you are very welcome.